Great. Well, thank you, um, Dallas and Isaiah. We're honored to have you. I just thought if you could spend a few minutes talking about um, Isaiah. You know, you, you know a lot about sports, sports business, sensing performance. But if you could talk a little bit about how you felt your training interests were represented when you were in the NFL, successful career, and how to how you try to do that now in your sensing company in Dallas. Just spend a couple minutes talking about the organized training regimen you spent 15 years putting around special operations fighters and how you represent their interests in tr training for deployment. Uh, yeah, so I, I can talk a little bit. You know, I think the first piece is you know, my time as a player. I think I look back on, uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, <clears throat> I never, yeah, you know, I always felt like I was guessing when I was training. And I think, you know, training for the war fighters is the same way. And uh, I was very self-motivated, wanted to put a lot of time in. Uh, but I constantly was guessing, and if there was ever a question when I asked myself, did I do enough, I'd do more and do more and do more. And I constantly was overtraining uh, over time, which in the end really, I think, was shooting me in the foot on uh, not allowing me to feel my best come game day. Because in the end, that's what it's all about. It's what, that's why everybody has to train and train as hard as they do. Can I put myself in the position to feel the best that I can possibly feel? And quite honestly, that's not limited to an elite athlete. That's... I think we all want to feel like that. Um, so that's kind of like, that was my experience, uh, in, you know, looking back on my career, um, you know, playing eight years, then transferring over into the, the entrepreneurial world uh, where I joined MC10. I've been over there going on my sixth year at MC10 around building thin, flexible electronics. Uh, this is the BioStamp. We released this into the research community uh, about six months ago. It's been a smashing success. Um, uh, and think about this as a location agnostic way to gather highly accurate data outside of a controlled setting. Uh, and that's highly relevant to sports and sports use cases where table stakes are you can't wear clunky devices on body uh, to play, uh, to practice, to, do, to train. Uh, it's just not going to happen. And uh, the richness of the data as you look across different sports and um, really try to optimize performance, minimize the risk of injury, uh, is deeper, richer data sets that really speak to a lot of what we talked about in the morning, the machine learning aspects uh, of multiple complex data sets, you know, 12 streams of data coming in at a time. I'm actually wearing three of these on body right now. Uh, and the ability to capture 12 streams of data simultaneously, um, think about how A, complex that is, but then B, how much you can actually put uh, and cont contextualize that data to draw meaning into it instead of everybody slicing and dicing Me Too wearable electronics from the wrist and saying, hey, I can slice the data this way. I can slice the data this way. This is completely novel data sets that then allow insight uh, across the body. Um, first of all, just thank you for having us down here. This is a, um, this is a great, great video. It's pretty amazing. Um, so and the reason I say that is, um, yeah, I work with uh, Special Forces in uh, Virginia Beach, and a, uh, um, I've been there for about 15 years. And, and the program didn't grow out of something I designed. It was from very forward-thinking commanders at the time who kind of looked around and surveyed the, the guys who they were commanding, and they said, we have a lot of people getting hurt, and why are they getting hurt? And did you know, a quick look around, and they figured out that you know, almost 70% of the reason the guys are getting broken down is wear and tear, um, personal training, you know, group training, you know, just going out and playing soccer or football on their own or something like that. And so they said, hey, you know, we're losing guys um, to things that are non-operational. How do we make this better? How do we make training more relevant and more um, in tune to what uh, the military needs? So they looked around and they said, hey, what does, you know, what does Olympic Training Center do? So what does professional sports do? What do places like USC or the NCAA do? How do they train their athletes for the job they do so we can train the operators for the job they do? And then obviously the, uh, this, this was you know four years into uh, the start of the war, and the war's been obviously we've been kind of getting at it for over 15 years now. So um, the idea of just uh, performance or operational performance is um, you know that that's kind of the sexy portion, but the the real um, merit to the program that kind of got started and, and the emphasis behind it was operational longevity. 15 years is a long time to do something. 15 years is a long time to go and, and deploy and come back and rinse and repeat and train and rinse and repeat. So um, we can make people bigger, faster, stronger, leaner, whatever, but you know, the career we, we, you know, we aim for is long. It's not two to four years and hopefully you make it through. It's 
couple decades. Okay, so um, the program that we that that is not, and that's just where I am. It's it's throughout naval special warfare or throughout you know special operations really revolves around operator performance, operator longevity, and then rapid return to whenever they get hurt because they're going to get hurt, and we just try and bring them back. Um, to add on top of that, the complexity of the family situation, and it's been talked about here. You talked about this, uh, when you sat on with the at the military consortium. How do the caregivers, the family members, all focus in on that um, and take care of that? And are they part of it? Um, do they feel like they're part of it? And do they feel like their their spouse, the guy who's going out and coming back, are getting the best care that they can get? Um, that's really a, how the program has holistically grown around um, in, in special operations. I think one of the like fundamental things when it comes down to who represents the warfighter or the athlete really comes down to like a leadership and like so is it, is it an entity or is it a person is it an institution or is it an individual so one of the things that I think um, is really unique to sport well it's unique everywhere but certainly unique to sport and military is the constant churn in leadership you know if you're in the NFL how many head coaches did you have how many position coaches did mm -hmm. you have they got two to three years max and in the military, it's every two years a commander is in and a commander is out. There's, so there's consistent churn. And so as a, from your experience, who does the warfighter trust in, in this, to, to represent them in this space? And if you could answer that, and then if, if Isaiah, if you could answer, who, who does the athlete, who do they turn to, who do you really trust? That's a good question. Um, yeah, there, there obviously is a very high turnover and, uh, in, in leadership. And so um, that was part of the reason why uh, setting up, um, you know, civilians, uh, government civilians, to be the um, the continuity of the program. So they'd be there year in year out. The vetting process for hiring, bringing in people who could understand um, that process, and the guys who were going to be there and, and and empathize and 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 do that training, and gain that trust. So um, each one of those point providers is somebody who represents that you know that operator. To um, back to them, so they get you know they so they trust, but then up up to the leadership and back, so they can we can uh, uh, we can talk to them. Say hey, you know these are you know when you're traveling over a certain number of you know uh, uh, from coast to coast to go train, they've just lost you know we had a three hours difference in, in in time zones, and now you're expecting them to jump out and start training right away. There's a huge shock. The system has always been kind of overlooked. In sport, they figured it out. You know you you know. You're much more likely not to have a positive outcome in a game traveling east to west than going west to east. Well, you know, if you're if you're going to fly from east coast to the west coast, go train, go train at night. You've lost a lot of uh, you have your your, your your rhythms are off, hormones are off, and then you're going to do that on a repetitive basis. Um, the medical community and then the uh, the procurement performance program needs to be one to step up and say, hey, this is kind of what's going on. How do we how do we how can we try and adjust this? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think <clears throat> when I think about the question you pose right there, I, I think it really starts with the individual. There's this self-motivation um, that, you know, as I was a player, my, my body was my business. And I took a lot of pride in that. And, you know, in, in a way that, you know, where, you know, and I wasn't by myself with that. You see a lot of very motivated uh, athletes in the NFL, but they don't know where to turn, which is why I love um, – the concept and the, the organization that you guys are building, which is there's a safe haven. So if that motivation is there, then point me in the right direction and get domain experts uh, to help me optimize how I train because in the end, that's what it's all about. Um, and you know, using and putting all of that work in the off season and hitting the nail on the head every single time uh, you can go out there or trying to uh, and through a multiple uh, set of ways and in the end, it's is the way I think about it in the eyes of technology as it, as it exists is <clears throat> technology exists where I can start putting together a blueprint uh, to be able <clears throat> to put me in the best position, the highest probability of feeling my best. And that's what you can hope for at the, at the very at the very highest, highest level. So but that starts with with this internal motivation to then, hey, where can I turn of people that I can trust um, across the board? There are people in the organization that are mainstays, regardless of what coaching staff comes in or out. And um, yeah, I think the Eagles are actually a, a really good example of, of that, which is there's this trust factor that builds up over time. Paul Robbins, I know he's, I've talked to him about this as well, 
Um, but again, that starts internally and in being able to buy in overall and then having that trust factor of, you know, Leslie, you, you mentioned this already, that data can't be used against me come contract time, come, you know, hard decisions on cutting player time. Um, John Vincent was telling me on a phone conversation that he thought some of these player issues and team issues, league issues would go away if there was a really good business model behind some of this that would benefit the player, the league, the team. So will there be a day, I mean, watch what you ask for, because if I'm just curious about this. If you could tell a 24-year-old wide receiver, a warfighter, to some degree of certainty, and it's a big play, it's a big game, if you run that route or we do this play, our, our metrics tell us there's a 70% chance you're going to blow out your knee. It's not just going to be, it's going to be a, something that you're going to be out for a season or forever, ACL, whatever it is. Um, would that young person still want to take those odds? Because somebody's going to have to agree that nobody's going to, in this day where we can really predict this stuff, you know, we can nail it down, that nobody, that, they're not going to play that guy because the odds are against him. But will a player, I mean, does a player want that or do they, 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 you know, they want the glory? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think everybody's different, and some people prefer more data to less data. Uh, in the end, I think it's all about you know making uh, informed decisions, right? And I think data allows allows you to make informed decisions. How you perceive risk, and as you you know want to roll the dice with your body. In the end, a lot of NFL players roll the dice with their body. <clears throat> Without that data, it'd be great to roll the dice with that data. Uh, is the way I personally think about that. So it'd be your choice. Yeah, I think it should be your choice as a player. Uh, I mean, in the end, it is. It is your choice as a player. Uh, you know, this is your livelihood. Uh, much like you go to work every every day, it's it's a livelihood. You have to support yourself, your family, everything else. You make that decision to be able to step step out. Now, a lot of the the decisions in the past have been in kind of this cloud of mystery of you know, you know whether it is you know, a joint impact to training to. Uh, you know, had impacts as well. It's, it was just kind of this cloud of mystery. You start laying out data sets to that. Um, now, does that take over the the entire entire you know qualitative X factor human print, print side of this? Absolutely not. But uh, I think informed decisions are always better. And you know, creating this wall of performance side versus media content side. Um, I couldn't agree more with John's uh, take on that. Where <clears throat> that's really going to win a lot of people over. You could start in performance, but once you show massive value in like a tier three sport to then bring to a tier two and then a tier one like the NFL, NBA, et cetera, it's going to be lights out. Unions are going to start to agree with it and agree with the leagues with it. And uh, you're really going to see uh, just completely amazing, unique data sets and engagement like you've never seen it before. How do you, what's the equivalent of pulling out a special operate? That, what, are their, what are their views on whether they're injured or not, whether they're, um, that, not those are yeah those are those are made uh, on the, by the medical department and then uh, like the squad uh, commander or team commander. So um, much like he said, they're you know highly highly motivated to be in there and they will they'll go in at fifty percent at forty percent of them because they just don't want to miss. So um, you know pulling someone out uh, there it wouldn't be up to the human performance problem. That, that would definitely be a medical. Uh, how do you Medical think call. about that problem, though, when you train them, when you know they're going, they want to go back at 40%? That feels like a pr big problem. Well, that, that's kind of the, the idea behind the whole, the whole uh, integrated program between uh, human performance and, like, sports medicine. So we're training someone to understand they're at 40%. They, they get a referral. I mean, they're, they're sent to sports med, so they already start getting taken care of. And then that, that, you know, that switch gets flicked. So, you know, they're getting, they'll start to get the care. Um, that they need, and if it's if it's significant, they need, and they get pulled out, they'll get pulled out. But um, when, when we started, and it, it took a long time, to, you know, nobody wants to get pulled out, nobody wants to miss a rotation, nobody wants to miss the deployment. So the fear is, and I mean, you probably had this, this too, is the fear is if you go to medical, you're going to get pulled out. So that was a large stigma that took a good 15 years, almost 20 years, to get rid of. So that fear is, you know, pretty much gone. Guys will go now for tune-ups. Guys will go for checkups. So uh, we've kind of, we've kind of, uh, um, kind of solved that piece, which was, which is a large piece that, that trust of going to sports med and knowing that, hey, you're not getting yanked out because something bad, unless there is a significant problem. Then they understand that if the recommendation is made by the senior medical officer, that it's, this is probably not a good idea. Their best interests are being held at. And this is where I think like it's really interesting to, to look at all the data as you as you were just alluding to Isaiah and start to figure out really where the red lines are right where it really does become more of an ethical issue 
uh, above anything else, and then giving people personal choice inside of that. I'm, I remember in 2007, um, uh, we were, well, 2008, um, but 2007 San Diego Chargers, Philip Rivers blows out his knee in the Indianapolis Colts game. Uh, Billy Volk brings us back, and we end up playing the New England Patriots, who were undefeated at the time. And Philip, there were three people in the organization who knew that Philip was playing without an ACL. Um, and it was his choice to play that game. It was his choice and his choice alone. And I think at the end of the day, you still, as, 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 an, as a, either as a warfighter or as, a, um, as an athlete, again, it is a, it is a non-normal you know, population of individuals who we are choosing to exist in that environment. Having better information is, is great, but really understanding where the red lines, in, I, red lines exist, I think, is really important, and educating them on that. So, I mean, did you, did anyone ever tell, talk to you about red lines, whether it be, I mean, obviously the shoot du jour today is, you know, is, uh, is concussion and whatnot, but was that ever addressed during your NFL career? Uh, no. I mean, the, the, the closest proxy I could probably make to that was, you know, at one point um, I was training three times a day, which was like overkill uh, in the off season. And uh, that was, that was, all right. That's there's a red line there as you probably should limit that to one, maybe one and a half. Don't do that. But that's that was kind of very qualitative. That, that was not um, kind of quantitative based uh, advice. But no, you know, this idea of um, you, you essentially put red lines together. If you you, know, you have to be able to measure something so you, you can't improve or avoid something you can't really measure or you have a very difficult time being able to do that. So you won a couple Super Bowls. Did you trust your team to, to take care of your health, or was that just your own thing? I never won a Super Bowl. I lost a Super Bowl. <laughs> oh, you lost a Super Bowl. <laughs> no, no. Congratulations. Did, um, I'm not going to call uh, Philip Rivers Phyllis anymore. Now that I know he played with a, when he, when he makes a bad play, I'm not calling him Phyllis anymore. Oh yeah, because no, no, no. he's tough. He played with no he's ACL. Forget people, yeah. never Phyllis again. Uh, sorry, what was the question? I, I got I got diverted. Did you think having lost a Super Bowl? Did you think that? Did you think the team represented? your best health interest, or was it even an issue for you? you wow, that's a really complex question. Uh, it definitely varied. Uh, Steve can, can, can attest this as well. It varies by team. It did, especially when I was playing. Uh, it varied. You know, I played for three teams. Most of my career was in Seattle, but I played for the, for the Rams and Oakland Raiders. Three vastly different experiences based on uh, if, if I thought the best interest for me uh, were in front of mind for every single person. Uh, so much so where yeah, I remember being in a training camp at one of those places and <clears throat> having a pretty uh, gruesome injury it ended up turning out to be, but being urged to get back on the field by the medical staff because the team needed me out there. It has nothing to do with their assessment of injury, et cetera. Um, that was like a, a light bulb went off in my head. It's like, mm, that's probably not the best interest. You know, you as a doctor being objective and looking at me and being able to just diagnose the situation without blocking everything else out, which is his job. Uh, it didn't happen. That, that, that felt like it wasn't aligned with my best interest. Um, I would say overall, um, I could speak about Seattle. Seattle was amazing uh, around being able to do that. And for warfighters, though, I mean, sometimes you, I mean, especially in the teams, right? I mean, sometimes having that unit together actually is, is incredibly valuable on a mission. Yeah. So how do you, how do they do that risk analysis? Um, I, you know, you'd have to, to get down and talk with them, but a lot of it would just be, are, are you ready to go? And yeah. the head will always nod. And, and I, there's, there's more uh, stories about guys going out with, who, who you know, are hurt. And they're just not going to let. They're not going to let somebody down. Right. And they'll do that every time. Let's thank these presenters thank for you. a fascinating discussion. Thank you.